So, um, as you probably know, we're experiencing a major transition where the global energy sector is shifting from fossil fuel based systems to alternative energy sources. And this is what is called the energy transition. In fact, in a context of growing global population, the demand for low carbon technologies is increasing. And particularly this growing scale have pushed the technology into innovative areas where there's need to harness large streams of data. And we know that by focusing on AI, advanced computing and simulation techniques, we can actually extract relevant information from this data. So the challenge today is how to help drive a decarbonized future by leveraging AI and data. Doesn't go to the next slide. Tack. Okay. I will start by discussing why energy transition, the science behind it, and where it stands in the climate change framework. In the second part, I will be discussing the use of AI in different alternative energy technologies with a special uh, focus on uh, wind and solar for production. Do you see my, uh, my mouse or not? When I, when I change the mouse? Yes, we see it. All right. Okay, yeah. thanks. On hydrogen, um, the case of hydrogen will be discussed in storage and the case of smart grids for distribution. So let's start by the science of energy transition because it is neither a fashion nor an ideology, but something is scientific based transformation that has consensus around the world. Actually, the human impact on greenhouse gas emissions and the effects on the climate system have been documented longly in the scientific uh, publications. What you see on the left is according to NASA, the evolution of the annual planetary temperature. We see that since 1980, it's a little bit above one degree. And one degree is a lot because with respect to the ice age, for example, it was five degrees which means that basically in a century, we're doing what nature has done roughly in 10,000 years. On the graph on the right, each, the graph shows the growth of greenhouse gas emissions in gigatons of CO2 equivalent, and it presented by type of gas. You can see from, it, from, uh, from here that CO2 emissions have two origins, either fossil or biogenic. Biogenic meaning it comes partly from burning biomass. And the most important part being that coming from the combustion of fossil fuels. There's a consensus within the scientific community that the increase of temperature shown by the graph on the left is due to the increase in greenhouse gases in the graph on the right. And the effects of climate change are devastating and irreversible as CO2 remains in the atmosphere for several centuries. And there is unprecedented effort to stop it. As we've seen, the majority of greenhouse gases are due to the energy consumption, which breaks down here to the following energy source in millions of tons of oil equivalent. This is the total world primary energy. We see that 81% of the primary energy emits CO2, 26% of it coming from coal, 32% coming from oil, and 23% coming from gas. Therefore, the major challenge of energy transition is to reduce the use of fossil fuels. Today, we are at the fork where basically either we set a threshold and reduce greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently to limit the increase in global average temperature to two degrees. This is compared to pre-industrial level. And this is the agreement that countries have done at COP21 or we fail to do so, and emissions will continue to increase and temperatures consequently. And this will lead to disorders in the future. So energy transition is the only way to avoid a climate disaster and air pollution. And where it stands in the climate change framework, actually there are two types of actions or approaches to responding to climate change. That is either by acting on the causes or acting on the consequences of climate change. 
If we act on the causes, this refers to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the share of fossil fuels or by carbon capture and storage. This is called mitigation. And in the energy domain, this will be the subject of the stock. However, of course, there are other domains that contribute to mitigation, like reducing N2O emissions in agriculture, increasing carbon sinks and forests, etc., etc. Acting on the consequences of climate change, such as increased flooding, more intense storms, whatever, is called adaptation. But we're not going to handle this part in today, and we're going to concentrate on mitigation in the energy area. To explain what decarbonization means, here I chose to consider the Kaya equation, which is an arithmetic evidence that breaks down CO2 emissions into socioeconomic factors that are carbon content of energy, energy intensity of GDP, the GDP per capita, and the population. CO2 is equal to these factors. Now, to reach neutrality, we need to divide CO2 emissions by 2.5, knowing that in 2010, we were at about 50 gigaton of CO2 equivalent, and we need to go down to about 20 in 2050, which means actually the division by 2.5. So on which factors can we play in this equation to divide the CO2 emissions by 2.5? Actually, the options are limited to act on the last two factors, as it's not so easy to reduce rapidly the population. In fact, if we look at the uh, median scenario of the UN, the population is expected to grow by a factor of 1.4, multiplied, sorry, by a factor of 1.4 by 2050. And concerning the GDP per capita, if we look at the average over the last 40 years, it was growing by about 2% per year per capita. So if we consider, we assume the same thing, then the GDP per capita would be multiplied by 2.2 by 2050. And we're left by basically two options. We can act on carbon content of energy or on energy intensity of GDP. Of course, this is not a projection, but just calculations that are made for illustration. And here I chose to divide both terms by 2.8 equally, supposing that or assuming that we have an equally distributed effort to act on both terms. But of course, there, are, there may be plenty of other options. So the consequences of Kaya's equation are the following. We, can, we have two ways to act based on it. The first way is by decarbonizing energy. And this can happen in two possibilities, either by completely changing the primary energy source, which leads to changing the vectors and increasing storage, the coal and gas transformed to uranium, renewables, oil to low carbon electricity, etc., so transforming the whole system, or by reducing the emissions of primary sources that we have, that is by carbon capture and storage, for example. A second way is by reducing energy intensity. This is acting on the second term. And this can happen either through improving energy efficiency actually both doing energy efficiency and energy sobriety, which, re which refers to changing the habits of users and uh, encouraging sobriety. This diagram is somewhat a translation, a translation of the previous one, but it's more precise and concrete. And the main message I'd like to highlight here is that the energy transition is not just about low carbon solutions in production but it also concerns vectors and uses. It's gonna happen at all levels. And there are clearly storage issues because fossil fuels are storable, while in low carbon energies, only nuclear, biomass, and hydro are storable. Wind and solar are not, and hydrogen is storable. So in that sense, it is controllable in the sense that it produces on demand. We, get, we will get back to hydrogen a little bit later. What are the possible scenarios? According to IEA, this is a representation of possible trajectories of energy production in millions of tons of oil equivalent. 
knowing that the graph on the left is actually the pi that I showed earlier. And on the right, you have the change from 2019 to 2030 with different scenarios ranging from steps, the business as usual scenario up to the net zero emissions scenario, 2050. This one is confirming to the Paris Agreement. And again, it's only a projection, but you see a drastic decrease in fossil fuels with hardly anything left by 2030. And a significant increase in renewables a little bit of nuclear in 2050 in the net zero emissions scenario. Several countries introduced targets to achieve this net zero emissions scenario. So what is the picture in Europe? Uh, in Europe, you see that the um, EU electricity generation will increase and the technologies that are expected to develop are wind offshore, solar, bioenergy, this gives you an idea of the low carbon technologies to be developed in the future, according to IEA. In summary, decarbonization is inevitable and goes through all these low carbon technologies that we've seen. Now we will discuss how AI and HPC can play a role to accelerate all this transformation. In the coming slides, I will select actually only a few examples of low carbon technologies due to lack of time, but of course there are plenty of them. In production, I will first discuss wind and then briefly go over solar. Offshore wind has become a mainstream energy source. And you see from the previous slide that it has a lot of potential in the future. However, we need continued innovation to realize its full potential because it has plenty of challenges related to complex and highly coupled phenomena that span through a large cascade of scales. For wind energy, if you look at length scales, they range from weather systems at a global level down to the boundary layer of a wind turbine. If we look at time scales, it, range, it ranges from seasonal fluctuations in weather to local dynamic control at the level of the wind turbine. And all this poses great computational challenges, whether for the construction and design of uh, the wind blade or for important phenomena to models such as the physics atmospheric flow and wake effects. In fact, in a cluster of wind turbines, wake effects are important. Why? Because they result in areas with lower wind velocity than the ambient undisturbed wind. This leads to higher turbulence levels and will eventually affect the performance of the turbine. This is why it's highly crucial to accurately simulate these wake effects using, for instance, high fidelity, large eddy simulation uh, modeling. Another challenge is the multi-scale nature of turbulence and its interaction with the wind farms. HPC and AI have a role to play in all these challenges. They can address those problems and help accelerating the simulation codes that are used in this domain. AI could also help maintenance, damage detection, and inspection of these large rotating machines because they are, off, whether offshore or onshore, especially those that are offshore in this case, we wanna visit them as little as possible, ideally. AI could also accelerate LIDAR real-time data processing. And this is for getting more exact wind speed and direction. So in conclusion, HPC and AI can improve th the three main challenges in wind energy. First, the understanding of wind flows in general. The second thing is the improvement of materials and system dynamics. And the third thing is optimization of uh, the, the wind plants themselves, the optimization and control of fleets of, of wind plants, what is called fleets of wind plants. Now, we know that it is only by better modeling the wind system that we can better optimize that system. But traditionally, we've been using traditional solvers, using physics models. They have longly been used to represent physics flows. Nowadays, those can be replaced by 
neural network solvers. And in fact, why? Because large eddy simulations require very high resolution. If we want to go to high Reynolds number regimes, we need to capture very small near wall eddies. And for this, resolving these eddies cause the computational expense, making large eddy simulations scale almost as strongly with the Reynolds number as a direct numerical simulation. So to address this, we consider physics-informed neural networks that you probably know already what is, but I will go briefly through uh, the basics behind it. So neural network is used to approximate the solutions of the solution of a family of partial differential equations that usually is written this way, where nx is the nonlinear differential operator, x and t are spatial and, uh, and temporal coordinates. Omega and, ome and um, uh, the omega, partial omega, are the computational domain and its boundary. And here you have u of x t, that is considered the solution of the PDE, h of x, its initial condition, and g of x t, its um, boundary condition. Now, in a neural network, um, it, the, the u, u of x t, the solution, is approximated by a fully connected network and the set of boundary condition and initial condition as, as said here, where basically it takes the coordinates xt as inputs and outputs u and n of xt. The neural network is composed of multiple hidden layers, where the inputs of each hidden layer and the output of hidden layers are connected by this nonlinear function. This is called an activation function. So what happens exactly? A, an artificial neuron multiplies each input, xi, by a weight, wij, okay? And it adds them to get a weighted sum. And this sum is then passed through this nonlinear function and transform it to an output, y. That is the yj, okay? Sigma, is called an activation function, and uh, it represents the nonlinearity, as we say. But it's not enough. We need now to train the neural network. So what do we do? We construct what is called a loss function. A loss function uh, actually will permit to know how well the neural network is satisfying the PDE and its constraints, right? So if the network is able to minimize this loss function, then it will in effect solve the given PD. And this is what we want to test. The parameters of the network can be trained by the following loss function, where LR, LB, and L0 penalize the residuals of the governing equations, the boundary condition, and the initial condition. NR, NB, and N0 here are the number of data points for different terms. And in order to compute the actual LR, derivatives of the output with respect to the input are required. In this case, it is ut and nx. And such a computation is achieved in the neural network framework by using automatic differentiation. For example, it relies on the chain rule basically, okay? So this technique can be well implemented whether you prefer TensorFlow, PyTorch, different deep learning frameworks, no problem. But the governing equations as we show them, so why it doesn't work, okay? The governing equations are generic. So the loss functions and the training configurations have to be adapted on a case-by-case -case basis. Here I drew a schematic of the physics informed neural network as an example. It shows how to set up a neural network for the class of PDE that we considered. But again, this is a class of PDE that could be simplified, could be a heat equation, could be something much simpler. As discussed, we always have a fully connected neural network that is used to approximate the solution u of x t of the PDE, which is then applied to construct the residual loss LR for the boundary condition, the boundary condition loss, the initial condition loss L0, and all this requires computing the derivatives of the outputs with respect to the input as we said. 
Concerning the initial condition and boundary condition, these are imposed as hard constraints, either by changing the network architecture or uh, in some cases it could be even integrated in the last function. So the parameters then of the fully connected network are trained by gradient descent methods based on the back propagation of the loss function. And th this is the, the full picture of how framework of neural network works. In short, the solution using such a neural network can be determined with limited data or without any data, except for, of course, the boundary condition and initial condition. Only for probably specific problems such as inverse problems or data assimilation problems, the data constraints are then directly introduced in, um, in the loss function. I'd like to introduce here an AI accelerated multi-physics simulation framework. This is developed at NVIDIA. It is called SimNet. This toolkit allows solving the class of PDEs that we just, show, uh, that we just uh, seen using neural networks on GPUs. And in comparison with traditional solvers, SimNet can not only do parameterized simulations in a single run, but also it addresses problems that are not solvable using traditional solvers, such as inverse problems, for example, or real-time simulation. Traditional, problem, traditional solvers wouldn't be able to, to do the simulating geometries, for example, with several design parameters and so on. That was the idea behind developing SimNet. And basically, you could have complex geometries with discontinuities, singularities, etc., that are not easily treatable in traditional solvers. So SimNet offers several special features that overcome this. And additionally, most importantly for wind energy, it solves high Reynolds number flows using zero equation turbulence models. And again, as I said before, without using any data, despite the, uh, the boundary condition and initial condition. All in all, this helps improving the physics and predictions of, uh, that, that are needed, for example, Again, if we go back to the turbulence models, one can take the, um, the model and make it learn using the neural network on high fidelity results from direct numerical simulation. Then this learned model can be called from a computationally inexpensive framework that, that is a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes from within SimNet to get higher fidelity at low cost. SimNet's architecture is as follows. It is a TensorFlow-based neural network solver with source code available, by the way, at um, developer.nvidia.com slash SimNet. I can write it later in the chat. It offers various APIs and enables you to build your own application. Basically, the geometry modules, the PDE module and data are used to fully specify the physics system. The user then specifies the network architecture, the optimizer, the learning rate schedule. And SimNet then constructs the neural network solver for you. It forms the loss function that is needed. It unrolls the graph efficiently to compute the gradients, etc. And then it starts training or inferencing using TensorFlow. And this could be done either on a single GPU or on a cluster of GPU, depending on the hardware that you have. The outputs are then saved into um, our outputs into CSV or VTK, and uh, you can visualize it using TensorBoard or Paraview. Let me now give examples of, uh, of uh, research where AI has been applied. And later on, we will see in industry how, how things are uh, implemented as well. Here's a study where a physics-informed neural network is used for wall modeling in large eddy simulations. Large eddy simulations differ from Reynolds average uh, Navier-Stokes simulations in many aspects. For one thing, large eddy simulations is scale resolving in the sense that it is by, by itself a high fidelity tool. Conventionally, large eddy simulation wall models have been just physics and mathematics based. But with these, resolving all scales and high Reynolds number again 
is usually not possible because of limited computational resources. The authors of this study tested the neural network approach and implemented it in what they call the LESGO code. The details could be found in the reference here. They show mainly that the inclusion of physics considerations in the neural network would enhance extrapolation capabilities of the neural network and for, for actually for information that have been not included or in the trained data. Okay, that, uh, that basically they didn't train. So they, they took two challenging cases and tested the neural network. You see the mean velocity profiles here as a function of the wall normal distance for flows. On the left hand, for flows at a fixed Reynolds number, RE equals 10 to the power three. And on the right hand side, you have varying Reynolds number from 10 to the power three up to 10 to the power 10. And basically the conclusion is the train network is shown to capture the wall at the arbitrary Reynolds number uh, from ranging from 10 to the power three to 10 to the power 10. Another example is in studies of vibration and fatigue of wind turbines. This is actually important because the towers could collapse at any time due to material fatigue. It could result from excessive vibrations, for instance. In order to reduce the tower fatigue, the authors here in this study deploy what they call the nonlinear model predictive control approach whereby an artificial neural network is trained and tested to estimate the fatigue progression. The solution is then afterwards taken and introduced in a control system of the wind turbine in real time. But technically, the nonlinear or regressive networks with exogenous inputs seem to be best suited to predict this. The architecture of the artificial neural network is as shown here. Again, an input, a hidden and an output. It takes two inputs. Both inputs are connected to a delay block to take into account the current and past info on the fatigue signal. The activation function is usually a hyperbolic tangent function in such neural networks. And the output layer incorporates a linear function. For vibration control, a radial basis function neural network is applied, where basically the theoretical basis here of such a network lies in the interpolation of multivariate functions, such as, such as um, the function that I wrote here. Of course, more details, again, can be found in the reference. A tool based on such networks has been implemented by a third list of authors in the following reference, where they have developed a GPU-based code to optimize and control vibrations, specifically a GPU-accelerated code using Python and CUDA named PIGA uh, OWT is shown to run faster than its CPU version called AOWT with a factor of 2001 as shown by the authors. This is making feasible at the end the optimization of dampers under real wind conditions. Now how's the picture in industry? The challenges we discussed before are also addressed by industry today. So General Electric performs high fidelity wind and farm simulations as well. They look at specific challenges to optimize the layout of a wind farm. The goal there is to maximize the generated power and reduce the loads experienced by the turbine by accumulating basically uh, all the different problems that we discussed before, atmospheric stability, turbulence and shear of the wind, all the turbulent, all the, all the turbine physics that we've discussed before. And GPUs are ideal for this. So General Electric uses GPUs for handling their large data sets and for training the machine learning models as shown in this illustrative snapshot. As said, during the GTC presentation of their CTO, machine learning models help reduce simulation time from months to days for large farms. Of course, depending on the size of the farm, the larger the farm, the more benefit you get from HPC and AI. Another application of AI in industry is for, bl uh, for blade inspection. AI is used by NNAI Sense and Susan Schmidt 
to draw conclusions from inspection data to analyze damage progression over time in an autonomous way. For this, AI object detection algorithms are applied and they are then sent to blade experts for refinement. All this, of course, all these techniques help avoiding blade failure and early detection of defects. And all in all, it leads to reduction of costs in operation and maintenance in general. The second technology I will address briefly here is solar energy. Solar power can happen by either converting energy from sunlight directly using photovoltaics or indirectly through what is called concentrated solar power or a combination of both. In both technologies, we deal with complex optical systems and material synthesis challenges. Data storage with high capacity and high processing is also needed. In optical simulation tools, we combine wave optics with ray tracing techniques to calculate the incident flux on the receiver, right? Or for such applications, we're investigating the use of Omniverse. It is NVIDIA's multi-GPU real-time simulation platform. It provides efficient real-time ray tracing updates and could be used for rendering, for example, in order to optimize the performance of lighting scenarios in solar farms. Machine learning can also be used to assist material screening for better insulation. This will help, for example, reducing heat losses and improve the solar, the solar panel efficiencies in general. Finally, AI is used to improve solar forca forecasting. This is a crucial topic as solar power is characteristically intermittent. So uh, forecast models are traditionally trained as micro level solutions where a single model emulates the entire photovoltaic system. But today with deep learning, deep learning can capture low level power outputs and improve therefore the accuracy of the forecasting. Let me show you some examples in industry. AI is starting to develop in agrivoltaics. It is an emerging system that suggests a combination of solar panels and agriculture to optimize the land use. Okay, and here AI algorithms are used to dictate the position of the panel in such a way that the light that is needed by the plant is taken into account in real time over its time development. Okay. Another example of application is solar tracking. This is done at the Solar Energy Research Center in Spain. Most technologies in solar try to improve efficiency by concentrating solar flux by optical systems or by exposing the receiver directly so that it captures as much solar radiation as possible. But since the position of the sun is constantly changing, the system has to account for that in order to receive radiation in an optimal way. So in this study, uh, the scientists at SciSol proposed a solar tracking system based on computer vision, specifically on deep convolution neural network. It is, it is a particular class of deep neural networks. I'm not gonna go into the details of, um, of it but it's commonly applied to image and video recognition. And the figure here shows training images examples. And each image will be classified according to which class it belongs to. Is it the sun? Is it the cloud? Is it the heliostat, etc.? Such systems can help improve and allow autonomous control of solar farms. As I said before, energy transition goes beyond production. So now let's zoom in storage in particular, the case of hydrogen. Hydrogen being a vector of energy, not a source of energy. This is why I did not put it in production. I put wind and solar in production because wind and solar are sources of energy, but hydrogen needs to be produced. It's not a source. The problem today being that low carbon production of hydrogen is not yet competitive. So I drew a hydrogen map here because it is essential to understand that the role hydrogen can play in all this transition. Knowing again that today the hydrogen production is produced from fossil fuels, resulting in carbon emissions. So the future, we need low carbon technologies for producing hydrogen. 
It is called green or blue, depending on whether it's produced by electrolysis or by vaporeformage of biomethane. And the hydrogen molecule is very small. So once produced, it must be stored and transported. And there are technological issues for storage due to its size. I won't comment on everything here, but I'd like to highlight that hydrogen can be a vector of innovation in production of steel, fertilizers, and in carbon capture. The most important use of hydrogen will probably not be in cars, but in industry and in heavy transport in the near term. For storage, modeling is essential and expensive. In fact, quantum mechanics tells us that the two protons in a hydrogen molecule each has a spin and are made up of quarks tied together with gluons. The spins can either be up and down or both in the same direction. Why am I saying this? Because there are two standard methodologies for numerical studies of magnetic and mechanical properties of materials. There are spin dynamics and molecular dynamics. You can see here the codes that integrate the equations of motions for spin, such as the VAS code, if you know it, or LAMPS. These are HPC accelerated codes. So HPC and AI is crucial to simulate all these complex quantum phenomena and, and the complex quantum fluid mixtures in general that are needed for, for uh, hydrogen. AI could also be used for better prediction, optimization, and assessment of hydrogen production methods. It could also be used in optimization of fuel cells and uh, in robots in general for manufacturing. Um, let me give here an example of how machine learning is used for uh, these uh, studies, but more related to the um, acceleration of discovery of electrocatalysts for hydrogen production. In fact, in the process of hydrogen production, the hydrogen evolution reaction requires the use of an electro electrocatalyst because otherwise hydrogen, the, uh, the water cannot be split into hydrogen and oxygen by itself. And the conventional water electrolysis faces technological challenges. So there's need to explore cheap and efficient electrocatalysts. These, the, this new study actually published two months ago lays out different ma machine learning algorithms for the discovery of electrocatalysts. The first approach takes input data and transforms it into a suitable representation that they call descriptors. It is then fed to a machine learning model. With the second approach, they take the images data from the database and they feed it into a deep learning model. We note here that a chemical composition could be a descriptor in material science, but those geometrical and electronic structures are actually, when used as representations, they are computationally expensive to employ for directly in the training. So deep learning provides an alternative second role and takes image-based data that could be of great potential for accelerating the development of electrocatalysts. Last but not least, power grid distribution will be key for successful energy transition because it is key for renewable integration in the power system. Now, is the um, distribution grid today up to the coming challenge? Probably not. So massive adaptation of the grid is necessary to accommodate the higher penetration of renewable energy. There is need for better adequacy of supply and demand. This will not only accelerate the integration of renewables, but it will also limit the need for storage. And it will also reduce the capex of production in general. AI-based approaches will play a key, role, a key role to find a shortest path in a grid to do monitoring in real time, to help supply and demand forecasting Smart meters and Internet of Things assessment tools, all these intelligent applications at the edge have a role to play to make a future smart grid which copes with the challenges of an energy transition. In conclusion, 
The first set of takeaways that I've, list, I've listed is general, related to energy transition being accelerated at an unprecedented rate. Data will be a game changer. AI and HPC are definitely enablers of this transformation. Here we've ha highlighted a few subdomains as examples, but of course, AI will have a role to play in the full ecosystem of energy transition. In addition, climate change is going to generate other AI applications. We discussed energy and mitigation, but of course there's a whole subfeed outside it as we seen in my earlier slide, agriculture, forests, and uh, feeds related to adaptation. The main technical taking is go beyond traditional computational methods because new scales require new methods. And my second takeaway, I would say, physics-informed neural networks have gained popularity. They have show, shown to be effective in applications where we do not know the precise uh, models. So uh, it is worth it to try them, particularly for wind applications. In solar applications, convolution neural network object detection are already used and are promising for uh, solar tracking. Machine learning can be used and helpful for discovery of electrocatalysts for hydrogen production. And of course, all the edge computing, robotics family will have a role to play and a transformative effect to accelerate operation, anomaly detection, maintenance, real-time analysis, reproducibility, etc. Thanks for listening to me and I'm open to questions. <laughs>